Bill, maybe you'd like to preach the sermon too. <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, it is kickoff Sunday. Welcome back to church after a long summer Sunday. This is set the tone for the year Sunday. This is be sure whatever you do, don't offend the newcomer Sunday. <laughs> this is a, if you get it right, they'll come back next week Sunday. And, and I thought to myself, hmm, the story of original sin. That's it. I have wondered many times this week if maybe I should have chosen 1 Corinthians 13 instead. And we could have just talked about love. Now, there are a few things, as Bill alluded to, that we can get out of the way. Um, and I am convinced there's a word of truth for us in this story. We can acknowledge that this is not a journalistic telling of the beginning of the world. It's more of a sacred story that was passed on from generation to generation. It's fair to say that it holds more truths about people's experience of God than it does about facts of the origin of the species. And I'm also, I'm actually not going to try to explain why it is that the serpent talked and God walked. Uh, you can do that in stories. And besides, who hasn't, who hasn't had conversations with voices in their head or their pet before? I'm quite convinced the serpent talked in this story. And then the, the, of course, the tricky bit, the original sin piece, uh, which, of course, is never mentioned in the Bible, right? There, there's no such thing as original sin in the scriptures. We have Augustine to thank for that. And in his defense, he was kind of trying to offer it to us as a consolation, as in, you know how it is you keep messing up in your life? You blame it on Eve, that was that's kind of what he was going for. Um, but long before a misogynist, sexist church got its hands on this text, it might have been called the story of original blessing. And on the flip side of that, it might too have been called the story of original shame. Because really it's about what happens when these two know that disconnection from their God. Now, you know the story. The garden's created. The humans are placed in it. The woman is created from the man's rib. I'm not going to explain that one either. God gives one measly instruction not to touch that tree or you'll die. And, of course, uh, then the snake enters and gets into this, I don't know, it's almost like triangulation, like trying to explain better what God had to say than, than God said for God's self, and convinces her that it's okay if you eat from the tree, you'll just know more, just like God. What could go wrong? And so... Eve takes some of the fruit, gives some to her no-good-for-nothing husband. No, that's, no, seriously, that's probably too far. But I do wonder, like, why he never offered any sober second thought at the plan. Like, just <laughs> passive until God shows up and starts accusing, at which point suddenly it's someone else's fault. Anyway, that's the story. Okay, so then they eat the fruit. Their eyes are opened, they see that they're naked, and they know for the first time in their life, shame. I don't know if it's shame that they're naked. I think it's shame that they know stuff they didn't know before. Shame that they are, for the first time, disconnected from their creator, from the source of love in their life. And so later that day, God goes for what seems to be like a leisurely stroll after dinner into the garden, and Adam and Eve are nowhere to be found. And this is the part I want you to notice. The first thing, the first thing that happens is God calls out to them, where are you? It's like a divine game of hide and seek, and God wants to know where they are. There they are, hiding, paralyzed in their shame, and they hear this voice. Can you imagine if those of us who were parents always parented in that way? Where are you? No, no sense of accusation, no hollering, what have you done? No, get out here right now so I can blame and shame and guilt trip you. None of that, um, I knew you couldn't be trusted with this sort of responsibility. 
the very first thing this personal, relational, animated God says to them is, where are you? And I don't hear it as an accusation, but an invitation. God cares deeply, not just about where those two are in the garden, but about where you are in your life. I call it original shame because that's the part that lingers, right? Those feelings of, I can't believe I did that again. Those feelings of, will I ever learn? I've blown it again this time. Every one of us accumulates a, a list of good intentions that were never realized or enacted, and it can spiral into this wondering of whether we are the only one, right? the only one who's carrying around so much baggage, the only one who can't get it right, the only one who's thinking, if they had any idea what a mess I am in here, whoa, watch out. The only, if they only knew the truth about me, if they could only see the, the string of bad choices that I'm carrying behind me. And I wonder if the garden story made it into the scriptures because this is such a true human story for each and every one of us, always. Look at God's response when we are in that state. Where are you? Not an accusation, but an invitation. An invitation to come back into relationship with your source, to come out from hiding so that you might show up in the light of day. It seems to me that coming out from hiding behind the stories that we tell, behind the shame that we carry, is one of the most vulnerable things that any of us can do. It's a real invitation to at once get real about where you are, lay it all bare, be honest with yourself, and, and to lean into that trust that the God we talk about, the God that's revealed in scriptures, actually wants to be in an animated relationship with us, doesn't leave us in the garden and walk away, but longs to be close to our very soul, to our very being. And I suppose I think this matters and it particularly matters in this time in which we're living because there's so much uncertainty, or, or you might say there's so much certainty that the world is coming undone. If we're going to show up in our lives as active, faithful participants in this world, it's going to be really helpful to know where we are to know where our starting place is each and every moment, to practice listening to a wisdom that's, that's larger than our own, that lures us moment by moment to the next best choice in our lives. And it's going to be imperative that we practice tapping into the connection one with another and God because there isn't a lot of time to hide in the bushes and reconnecting. It's key to stepping out in our lives and in this world that we're faced with. I've been discerning and questioning and thinking for many months now about this idea of spiritual practice, and I've wondered if a focus on spiritual practice might be helpful around here, not to say we don't already do it, but to name it. And part of the doubt in my head says, well... I mean, what difference is that going to make? People have been trying to practice being Christian for generations. Look where that's got us as an institution. But I come back to this idea, what does it look like to practice being okay in our own skin, being real about our shame, about the baggage that we carry, about the countless times we make choices that we then regret, and how that impacts our connection obviously on our relationships with one another, but also with our source. It's my conviction that the deeper we can go, the more we find we're connected to one another. And the more connection we feel, then the more our hearts can open to connection more widely than just our inner circle. And so spiritual practice, as I talk about it and as we try to lean into it in this community over the coming months, it's not about obliterating the shame. I can't take that all away in one swoop. It's not nullifying the fact that we are prone to poor judgment. Instead, it's a call to grounding, a deepening connection that more readily allows us to hear the voice of God asking, where 
are you? And over time, hopefully, we get a little more agile at responding. A starting place of connecting with ourselves might connect us to a hurting world, to more imperfect people, and most definitely to a God who never stops looking for us. And I want, um, I want to pause to show you a video clip that kind of gets at what I'm saying here, and then I'll finish off. But this is a clip from a pastor uh, who I quote from time to time, Nadia Boltz Weber. She lives in Denver. She's a Lutheran pastor, which I probably need to tell you because her appearance might not make that obvious. It was very, very hard to find a video where she wasn't cursing every other sentence, but I did. So... Starting at the beginning again, just to, and we'll just sit there and watch. So you might think in that that I've just said, well, actually, don't come to our spiritual practice groups. <laughs> but really, the nuance is when we practice in community, when we attend to our spiritual journey with one another, it doesn't make all the bad stuff go away. It doesn't make us never make a bad choice. No, it allows us to show those jagged edges a little more vulnerably and allows God and our fellow humans to connect onto them. And it seems to me that if we are going to be a people who show up in this time in which we live, a really important part of it is going to be building capacity to stand in our shame, to stand in our regrets and our guilt and our misgivings, and to see that others have rough edges too, and to rely on one another, to cling to one another, to cling to the love of our God so that we can be a people who don't operate out of fear, who operate out of a sense of reality that we're in this together and that God will never, ever stop asking, where are you? Show up this week to your life. God's waiting for you. Amen. So the choir is going to come and sing a song called Moving Up a Little Higher. And uh, I would say the only way we can move up higher is if we move deeper into vulnerable relationship with one another. That's how we move up higher. And uh, so as we sing the song, and as you get to know it, feel free to join us. The words are moving up a little higher, 
Every day my burden's getting lighter, moving up a little higher, receiving Holy Spirit fire. Calling to the Spirit each and every day, step by step I'm going all the way, I'm moving up a little higher, higher every day. The choir's coming up in a very interesting, staggered, kind of jagged way, as a matter of fact. We could just, uh, it's okay to be showing our weaknesses <laughs> and our entrances. All right.